Welcome to this session on molecular orbital theory, right? We're going to be learning about atoms, more specifically how atoms bond together. We're not going to be using the Lewis dot structure, which tells us that, you know, atoms have valence electrons and they can come close together and they can share or gain electrons to uh, or lose electrons to form covalent or ionic bonds. We're not going to be exploring just that. Uh, we're not going to be exploring deeply on the VACPR theory, which says that valence electrons, either paired or unpaired, distribute themselves so that repulsion between them is the least. And of course, then we saw bonding through that also. But it gives a sense of shape, nothing about energy of uh, electronic configurations and stuff. Uh, we're not also going to be talking about orbitals uh, within an atom. Well, orbitals we're going to talk about, but not within an atom. And you saw, you remember hybridization, right? Basically, at orbitals within a shell can transmutate or some things transfigure into a hybrid set of orbitals like this oxygen's uh, second shell giving you an sp3 hybridization and then corresponding bonding happening. This beautifully gives a sense of geometry, but it does energy predictions quite erroneously and it works only for the main block elements as such. Okay. Now, whenever we ask this question so far with what we've learned, how molecules form electrons of an atom combined with electrons of another atom, right? Electrons are always associated with the atom. But that's what we're going to change and learn in molecular orbital theory. Electrons in molecules occupy molecular orbitals, just like atomic electrons occupy atomic orbitals. An atomic orbital is monocentric. It, uh, it is basically electron probability around one nucleus of that atom. A molecular orbital is polycentric. This is a spread of electrons around two or more nuclei, considering the whole molecule. Electron probability in a molecular orbital described by a wave function spread over the whole molecule, right? Molecule theory focuses on electron energy and distribution, which gives a sense of shape, uh, bond order, all of those things. And it's all driven by a search for lower energy, more stable arrangement. That's the whole funda of chemistry, right? The idea of... Uh, atoms getting into lower energy, more stable arrangement. And for chemical interactions, we call that on electronic configurations, electronic arrangements and electronic energies. Okay, don't worry, it's quite easy. We're going to learn just, just as an introduction, we're going to learn a lot around molecular orbital theory. It's going to make life easier for you. And it builds on earlier understanding of hybridization electronic configuration. When I say hybridization, I'm referring to not uh, uh, orbitals within a shell of an atom hybridizing but the idea that there is an overlap of wave functions that you learned in hybridization we're going to call that on because we are talking about overlap of orbitals with similar energy and symmetry from different atoms which form molecular orbitals right and when i say electronic configuration the logic of how you put electrons of an atom into its atomic orbitals to find electronic configuration and thereby make a lot of inferences. That's kind of what you're going to do, except all the electrons of across all the atoms in that molecule are going to fill up molecular orbitals. And here also you adhere to the off bar principle, the Pauli's exclusion principle and Hund's rule. All of this applies even in the construct of molecular orbital theory. Okay. But how do these molecular orbital forms, uh, orbitals form? Well, hear me step by step. Okay. When atoms come close enough, very far away, they're not going to bond at all, right? If their orbitals have similar energy and symmetry, that means similar energy and symmetry needs to be there, then they experience an interference of their electronic wave functions, okay? Now, this interference, unlike what we've studied earlier, um, it's not just simple overlap. Such interference, not just a spatial overlap. It is a mathematical superposition of the wave functions. And you know, mathematical waves can interfere constructively or destructively, right? Now, I want to explore this deeper with you, but it's really hard to give you the actual orbital wave functions and stuff. Instead, here's a quick visualization. Think of this as your uh, sine wave, half of your sine wave. And if I go to a P block, it's a full sine, uh, sorry, P orbital, it's a full sine wave. Okay, let's look at S orbitals for now, or one half of a sine wave. Let's say there was another atom, atom two, which also has one half of a sine wave, which for our uh, for our analogy is like an S orbital. Okay. Now you see this is an addition of the electronic distributions around those nuclei, and this is a nice depiction of a uh, nucleus with an electron cloud around it. Now, of course, this looks like a sine wave because I've used a sine wave. The actual orbital wave is a little more complicated, but I know that you are smart enough to follow with me on this, okay? 
So here I have atom one and here I have atom two. Now they're far away, so there's no overlapping happening. But when they come close together, check out what's happening. Huh? They start interfering. Check this out. The wave actually adds up with this wave. Okay. And when they come close enough, check out this depiction. Between the nuclei, the density or the wave function improves or density increases which means it's a higher likeliness of finding electrons between the nuclei that means they are attracted to both the nuclei which is a very good state for atoms to be in or electrons of an atom to be in right well and nicely attracted occupying the space within the nuclei along the axis of attraction all of that is true now how do I understand destructive interference? Well, if this is uh, an upward pointing guy adding up with an upward pointing guy, if I have to subtract the two, then what do I have to do? I just have to flip the second guy, right? <laughs> so I'll have a destructive interference. Now, look at the 3D depiction. It still shows you the same kind of depiction because see, the wave functions are simply talking about mathematics of positive or negative. This is not uh, exists and does not exist, okay? so. Instead of adding two of them, if I have to subtract two of them, I can just flip the other guy and add them. It's the same logic. Now look at what happens when they come close together. Whoop. It's like they're cancelling out here. And oh, look at the 3D depiction. Okay, okay, follow through again. Whoop. It's like the region in between the nuclei is getting eaten up. <laughs> Fascinating, no? Okay, what exactly is happening here? Well, because it's destructive interference, this region in between the nuclei has a very less probability of finding electrons. That's not a good state to be in. Electrons don't want to be very far away from one nucleus or the other, right? Okay, so what did we see here? If I had s orbitals, on constructive interference, two of those s orbitals would in interact and form a high density region between the nuclei. On destructive interference, the two of those s orbitals would form a low density zero it's actually a node that's formed between the nuclei and then of course a low distribution between the nuclei not a good state and a decently good state okay hold on to that keep that in mind what if you were to think about it something like a, a p orbital okay now this whole sine wave kind of gives us an understanding of the p orbital check this out the 3d depiction kind of looks like a dumbbell right and this is an abstraction mind you but then look there's a downward guy and a downward guy so they are going to constructively add up. Down and down will constructively add. Up and up will constructively add. Let's bring them closer together. Now there's no overlapping. <laughs> that is so cool. Just like we saw with the S orbitals. These guys are constructively interacting and creating a high density or high probability of finding electrons between the nuclei. Right? It's a good state for the electrons to distribute this way and for the orbitals to overlap this way. Okay, great. Uh, what if I were to make it destructive? I just have to flip this guy around, negative and positive interacting. So that's destructive interference. Now check out what happens when I overlap. Look at, whoop, okay, look at the resultant. And now look at the orbital depiction out here, which is an abstraction. Oh, it's getting eaten up. Whoa, it's getting eaten up. <laughs> that is so cool. Okay, so again with constructive interaction or interference you had a high density of electrons between the nuclei along the axis of joining and with destructive interference you in fact have an additional node that gets created and a lower density between the nuclei Phew. okay so what does this translate to in our understanding well that abstraction tells us if these were s orbitals of two atoms i'm just going to split them up we're going to do the constructive interference here and the destructive interference here constructively what happened the region between the nuclei became high probability of finding electrons destructively what happened well the region between the nuclei you actually had a node and that's not a good state to be in now what is it mathematically if this was psi1 and psi2 constructive interference psi1 plus psi2 destructive is psi1 minus psi2 right this is a good state for electrons to be in that's why i've depicted it lower energy state is also lower and this one is higher uh, let's look at pz orbitals right pz is basically the head-on collision of those guys there is a node already let's split them up constructive and destructive look at constructive whoop increases between the nuclei and look at destructive whoop, more one more node and reduces uh, between the nuclei okay again what is this mathematically if this was psi1 and psi2 this is psi1 plus psi2 this is psi1 minus psi2 Simple understanding, right? Constructive and destructive. Now that's all there is to it. But remember, both of these are happening because of overlap of orbitals along the axis of colliding or coming together. Okay. 
these guys were atomic orbitals these are lower energy bonding molecular orbitals that are formed by the atomic orbitals s and p and these are higher energy anti bonding molecular orbitals formed by destructive interference it in fact introduces another node also in here okay and since these are both happening due to overlap remember from your earlier understanding these are both sigma bonds except you will call the constructive one a sigma 1s which will be of lower energy than the atomic orbital and a sigma star for the anti bonding molecular orbital which is of higher energy than the atomic orbital okay i hope you get that logic again for the sigma star here okay now how do these form we saw really quick atoms will be close enough and the orbital should be able to overlap significantly energy of atomic orbitals of both the colliding ones must be equal or nearly equal which means that you can't have a 1s interacting with a 2s and forming a linear combination right these are all criteria for linear combination atomic orbitals must be symmetric about the collision axis we saw that for s and we saw that for pz wait hold on speaking about symmetry uh, what if i had px or py now these guys are not actually symmetric about the axis of collision but they have a sense of symmetry and they have a sense of equivalent distribution and you already kind of observed this before when you saw other uh, theories let's look at really quick the lower energy bonding and the higher energy anti bonding whoop <laughs> check that out there was a one node and a one node these two guys got together it still has a node and there is a strong overlap this is good overlap this is bonding molecular orbital formed and this is an anti bonding molecular orbital formed check that out whoop not only is the same node there there's also another new node that's introduced since these overlaps are not happening along the axis what are these kind of bonds called huh that's correct pi bonds okay pi and pi star star means anti bonding simple as that now what if i had py and pz well they both have a sense of symmetry but about the axis they're not equitably symmetrical and their overlap is not going to be really strong so what these guys will not have linear combination happening okay simple as that okay orbital region should overlap energy of orbitals must be near equal and orbitals must be symmetric specifically about the collision axis great did you notice another thing we had two atoms 2s orbitals and we had one bonding and one anti bonding from there from n atomic orbitals you get n molecular orbitals bonding is nothing but psi a plus psi b anti bonding is psi a minus psi b in the simulation we actually flipped it and added it that was the same logic great a bonding molecular orbital is lower in energy because it is a better state electron distribution is more likely between the nuclei along the axis anti bonding is higher in energy it's a destabilizing state for electrons to be there because it's further out from the nuclei you in fact have a node between the nuclei and it's not along the uh, axis of joining okay molecular orbital theory we saw electrons occupy molecular orbitals and this is because they only reach a lower energy more stable arrangement and that's so cool molecular orbital theory gives you a sense of even why and if bonds will form to make molecules it gives you a sense of bond order it gives you a sense of shape it gives you a sense of energy it gives you a sense of magnetism so on and so forth i hope you learn a lot more all right